Good morning, church. Why don't you stand up to your feet? We're going to worship Jesus this morning. Put your hands together. There is a light that turns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes our fears away. Thank you, Lord. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Our prayer this morning, God. Father, we're on our knees with every heartbeat. We bring you this offering. Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place. Come fill this place, Lord. Jesus. Here we go. There is a king that reigns in victory. There is a mercy strong and
Worship you always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Give him praise this morning. We will give you praise always in every situation, whatever we're facing. Jesus, you are worthy. Hallelujah. Welcome to Bethel Full Gospel this morning. We are glad that you are here, that you have come out to worship our Lord and Savior together. You excited about that? You know, I believe that God rewards us when we come expecting, and I hope this morning that you've come into this place expecting to receive from God. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I hope you came this morning expecting. So we want to welcome you here this morning, and we want to remind you 8.30 is our masked service. The masked service. Sounds very ominous. Um, And and I want to just share this with you, because I think this is important. Every single week, we have families and people from Bethel returning for the first time. So we want to make sure they feel just as safe as you did the first time you came back. Uh, It's been six weeks. I know you're sick of these. I get it. But thank you for thinking about those who are just starting to come back now continuing to wear the mask, keeping the six feet apart, using the hand sanitizer, not gathering in the for this whole list of stuff. But as we do that together, we're making it more and more comfortable for people to return. That's what we want, amen? Uh, absolutely. So it is great to see you, some of you. Great to see you for the first time in a long time. Welcome back. We miss you. We love you. But today, it is all about Jesus, amen? We were singing that song, Lord come and fill this. We're not talking about fill this place with people. Fill this place with your presence. Because in the presence of God, he changes us. Amen? If you want the presence of God to change you this morning, raise a hand up with me and let's just pray as we kick this off. Father, we love you and, and we've sang it and now we pray it. Jesus, let your presence fill this house this morning. As we have gathered here to worship you, we've gathered here to hear your word. We've gathered together to be transformed by the awesome power of our amazing God. So Lord, we invite you today, fill this place, but more than that, fill every heart, fill every soul, fill every mind to overflowing with your love, your presence, your spirit. Have your way today in Jesus' mighty name. All of us church said together, amen. Come on, let's worship church. I search the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. You came along, put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied right here in your love. Sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is. Cause the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find.
lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is your heart will be also I just want to encourage you keep your heart your mind your eyes everything on Jesus because nothing in this world will satisfy just like we sang and God is better than it all thank you Jesus nothing is better than you
are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are here you're moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you you are we make your miracle work promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you
worship him today, folks, for everything that he's done for us, for who he is to us, and these promises that we can stand on every single day. time that is who that is who you are 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 let's declare God, and your promises always prove true. I thank you that we don't serve a wooden carved image or some, some other thing that sits upon a mantle. We worship the great I am, the one true king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Messiah, the God who was and is and is to come. That is who you are. So put your hands together, raise your voice, and give a shout of God unto him, for he is worthy to be praised. Yes, you are, God. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' almighty name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm Dan. And I'm Tasha. And we're the parental portion of the Hudsons. We have a few short, quick announcements for you. As we come back together, we want to remind you all of the service options that are available to you and your family. In addition to our indoor services, we are hosting a drive-in style service available both at 8.30 and 10.30. Simply park in the small parking lot and you can view the service from your car or bring a lawn chair and sit in the grass. Please remember to maintain six feet from others for social distancing purposes. And of course, we will continue to live stream our services Sundays at 8.30 and 10.30. Hello, Bethel. In lieu of Wednesday evening midweek service, we will be hosting a summer barbecue picnic. Please join us for food, fellowship, and fun. We just ask that you bring a dish to share and a lawn chair. Bethel will supply the hot dogs, the hamburgers, and the buns. We are excited to get together as a church community. Please register on the Church Center app each week where you will find the event, the location, and the time. Service opportunities. We continue to collect toiletries and food items for families in the Mohanneson and Shalmont School Districts. 
There's a blue tub in the vestibule at the offices located at 3669 Gildonan Avenue. Use the Gildonan Avenue office entrance, drop off your donations there, and we will get them to the people that are in need. Mark your calendars. Bethel will be hosting a blood drive with the Red Cross on July the 30th. The pandemic has caused a blood donation decline. Please consider giving this life-giving opportunity. If you've got any questions, call the church office. Tick, 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 tick. Hot off the press. Mega Sports Camp is back on. woo July 20th through the 23rd. Yes! We are taking some safety precautions and moving most of the activities outside. And we're looking forward to a great time and servicing our community. Enjoy the service. Good morning, Bethel family. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Whether you're in the building, in the parking lot, or online, we're grateful that you're with us. And we're grateful for the continued support and generosity during these difficult times. We know that it's not easy. Uh, but we know that God is on the throne doing amazing things and we love advancing his kingdom with you. Uh, we would encourage you to continue to give online uh, either at BethelFullGospel.com, the Church Planning Center app. You can also send your check to 3669 Gilderland Ave, Schenectady, New York, 12306. Make those checks payable to Bethel Full Gospel. And lastly, we do still have the text to give option. So those four ways to give are there for you. Please utilize them. Please continue to support the mission and vision here at Bethel Full Gospel. We love you. We look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you so much and enjoy your Sunday. Praise the Lord. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children to children's ministry. So if we've got some, men, some little ones sitting here, God bless you. You could head on back. Miss Nalene will be waiting for you there. And uh, you guys could remove your masks. You have already. I see that. That's good. If you'd like to, feel free to go ahead and take those down. Uh, starting a new summer series. Every year we do a summer series. Uh, and what we basically do this for is we understand that in the summer, especially this summer, Families are going to try to get away because when you all been locked up in your house for four months, it's nice to get away. All right. So the idea behind our summer series, and we do this every year, I think the last couple of years we've done uh, the, the Beatitudes, we've done the Ten Commandments, uh, we've done the I Am sayings of Jesus. We do stuff like this in the summer. So the weeks you are here, you'll get something and you didn't have to be here the previous weeks to understand it. Does that make sense? It, it, it can stand by itself, but at the same time, for those who are here every week, they certainly stack up and line up together. So this year, I'm kicking off our summer series, and we're going to be speaking for the next several weeks about the armor of God. Amen. Thank you. We're going to be speaking about the armor of God. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to get there in just a second. And why are we talking about the armor of God. I think this is important, and I think we need to understand this. And for, for some here today, maybe you need to remember this or just wake up. We are in a battle. We are in a spiritual battle. I am amazed at the number of believers who forget that we are in a battle. It is a battle every day. It is a battle against all the things that are around us. Jesus told us it would be this way. Jesus told us in this world you will have tribulation. John 16, This battle is a constant struggle and we all face it, but we forget it's a spiritual battle. The battle includes our, our struggle against these physical bodies and, and how they break down and, and the hardship it causes us. It's a battle against sin and temptation. It's a battle against distraction. Number one tool of the enemy against believers to distract you from God's purposes. It's a battle uh, against an ever-increasing godless culture that is, is pushing people further and further away from God. The Christian journey is a battle, and walking with Jesus isn't always easy. 
Sometimes it's a fight. I just finished up preaching about fighting for joy. You've got to fight sometimes. You've you got to work for it. Sometimes serving Jesus is tough. That's okay. Those, those TV preachers who tell you, come to Jesus so everything will be perfect, punch them <laughs> in the love of Christ. Yes, because it's hard. Why? Because we're in a battle. It's a, it's a battle. It's a struggle. It's a struggle against all these things I've listed and more. And we as believers, we need to remember, we need to kind of get our mindset correct and understand, listen, there's going to be hard times because we're in a battle. We're in a fight here. Now, here's the good news. We win. Come on. We win. We know that. It's guaranteed in Scripture. But it doesn't mean that the fight's fun. It doesn't mean that the fight is easy. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be times that we struggle. We certainly will. We have to remember, we are in a battle. Too many Christians are going through this, this Christian journey like they're on a cruise ship. But Scripture says it's more like a battleship. There's a big difference between a cruise ship and a battleship. There's a, let me just give you a couple comparisons here between a cruise ship and a battleship and kind of think about which one better defines your faith journey. We know that they have different purposes. There's different people on board. There's certainly different destination. Uh, one is designed for play, the other is designed for work. One's designed for comfort, the other designed for effectiveness. One is full of vacationers who enjoy multiple buffets throughout the day. That's, that's a cruise ship, in case you weren't sure. <laughs> the other one is full of enlisted men and women, and perhaps the most, the most telling is the destination. The destination for one is pleasure and comfort. The destination for a battleship is mission. As followers of Christ, this life needs to be less of a cruise ship and more of a battleship because you've been called by your commander-in-chief because he has given us a mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We can't be distracted with the things of this world, we cannot forget that we are in a battle. Very important as followers of Christ that you remember this. I shared a devotional earlier this week, I think. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, prowls about seeking whom he may devour. This is the kind of verbiage that Scripture uses to illustrate for us the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in. The devil, a real enemy who is looking to devour you. Oh, that's encouraging. Thanks, Pastor. That's what I do. Okay? This is, this is what the Bible tells us. So Paul is going to go into a, a whole teaching here on how to be ready and stand strong in the battle, but there's too many Christians walking around forgetting. Battle? What battle? <laughs> Everything's great. We think sometimes the fights with, with liberals, the fights with politics, the fights with, with government, the fights with other people, it's a spiritual battle. And the Bible told us we're going to be in a spiritual battle and we need to stand strong in the middle of this. The enemy's working overtime. Sickness, fear, disunity, hatred. Devil's a real enemy. Now don't get all weird and Pentecostal on me and start casting demons out of doorknobs and stuff, okay? But we know the devil's real. We know the enemy is real. We know the enemy is powerful. We know the enemy wants to destroy the work of God, destroy your faith, distract you, leave you shipwrecked. We have a very real enemy. This, this is why Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. So that's what we're going to be talking about for these next couple weeks. Paul digs a little deeper into the topic, tells us we need to suit up, we need to gear up, uh, we need to armor up. Why? Because it's a battle. And you don't want to walk into battle exposed. And this isn't just like for show armor, okay? <laughs> this isn't like for like a parade where you put on your little, you know, your, your dress blues. No, no, no. This is battle gear. And Paul lists for us the battle gear we as Christians need 
to be wearing to make it. Let's look at the, the passage that we'll be looking at for the next couple of weeks in Ephesians chapter 6. And today's going to serve mostly as an intro, and then each week we're going to kind of unpack another element in the armor of God. We'll see there's offensive and defensive uh, items listed here in the, in the armor. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, and put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Verse 14 says, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Verse 16 says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Paul lays out for us the armor, tells us how we need to suit up, how we need to gear up so we will be prepared for the battle that lies ahead. This morning, I want to look at verses 10, 11, and 12 as we as we begin this topic. Let me read those verses for you again. Powerful, powerful passage here in Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle. I love verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Some of us, we, we just need to remind ourselves of that regularly. Our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's unpack these three verses this morning for our sermon. Paul uh, starts this in verse 12 by saying, finally. Now, if you're studying the Bible, you can't start with finally. When you read finally, you got to see what he's talking about before that, or else the finally makes no sense. So let me give you a little background. Paul, the book of Ephesians, written to Gentile believers. They were not Jewish. They were new Christians, mostly first-generation Christians. Ephesians was a pretty modern city for its day, uh, pretty biz- busy business routes, trade routes through Eph- Ephesus. Uh, There was a lot of commerce going on through there. There was some wealth in there as well. In uh, Ephesus, the main thing they were known for was their temple to to the the goddess Diana or Artemis, uh, depending on which which, uh, translation you use there. And this was a super awful, perverted sex cult. Uh, So Ephesus, to recap, first generation believers, new to the faith, prosperous prosperous community, perverted beyond belief, okay? When we start to go through and look at things like this, it's, it's pretty easy to say, okay, I can see that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You hear Ephesus, you don't know a thing, but you hear prosperous, sex cult, and new believers, you're like, huh, oh, all right, they're in, they're in trouble. <laughs> so this new work is what the, these new believers are who Paul is addressing here in the book of Ephesians. And they were very much new believers in a very non-believing society. And we see this a lot in the New Testament. We see this in a lot of Paul's travels. He's bringing the gospel message to them, and it's a message they never heard before. And the, the comparisons with our culture are obvious. I mean, our world certainly has changed. Uh, we're no longer a Christian nation. There is a whole generation that knows nothing of God or Jesus or the faith. It's not a part of our culture the way that it used to be. Uh, Our society is perverted in ways we could have never imagined. 
That's not a figure of speech. 20 years ago, if I shared with you some of the things that are happening today, that I'd never even think that. Are you, are you kidding me? If you had a time machine, Marty McFly, you would go back and tell your 20-year younger self, it's going to get weird in 2020, <laughs> okay? Buy masks and toilet paper. Uh, never, never in a million years would we imagine. Of course, our country is blessed with prosperity like, like nothing the world has ever seen before, but all of these comparisons tie in together because it's against this backdrop that Paul is telling the Ephesian believers, you need to suit up. You need to put on the armor because the battle is coming to you. And here's the thing, it's coming whether you're ready or not. It's coming whether you believe it or not. You're going to be up against it whether you're prepared for it or not. So Paul is telling them, this is how you need to live as believers. And Ephesians is a lot of that. He's teaching them how to live as believers in the middle of this perverted, prosperous uh, culture that the Ephesians are with. Why? So their faith won't be destroyed. So their faith will not be shipwrecked. Paul likes to use that terminology. So with that as the background, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And Paul tells them, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's evil schemes. The full armor of God. Now, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the, the individual pieces. That'll take place over the next couple weeks. But I do want to pick up on the fact that Paul says you need to put on the full armor. Not the partial armor of God. Not the comfortable pieces, right? Because I would imagine... If I had a suit of armor here, there's going to be pieces that are more comfortable to wear than others, right? I'm thinking anything shoes or undergarments related, not going to be great made out of chain mail. I'm not a fan, okay? Helmet, those don't look comfortable at all. Sword, very cool, sign me up, okay? But we're not told to pick and choose the pieces that are best for us. We're told to put on the full armor of God. Because whatever you don't wear becomes your weak spot. If you wear most of the armor of God, but you leave a piece off, you are giving yourself a weak spot. You are giving the enemy an opening or a target. So you've all heard the expression, uh, your Achilles heel. Uh, you have the Achilles tendon in the back. This comes from Greek mythology. Uh, when Achilles' mom dipped him in the, in the Styx River, he was made in invincible except for the one spot she held him by his Achilles heel. Because his name was Achilles, she held his heel. You with me? Achilles heel? Okay. I know it's early, but come on. We're not serving coffee, but I can get you some caffeine pills if it helps. Uh, so... Achilles heel, that's the weak spot. And apparently he was killed in battle when someone shot an arrow into his heel. That's an incredible shot though, right? <laughs> like, wow, someone has good aim. So Achilles heel, it's our weak spot. It's the vulnerable area. When we don't put on the full armor of God, we are vulnerable. Now, the best piece in the armor of God is the helmet of salvation, right? Salvation, that's kind of good. That's a big deal. A lot of believers are walking around with a helmet and nothing else. I'm saved! Woohoo! I'm ready for battle! You are exposed and you are in trouble. You, good, yes! Wear that helmet, awesome! You need to get the rest taken care of. So Paul tells us, put on the full armor of God. Can't pick and choose your pieces, otherwise you have a weak spot. Otherwise you, you have a blind spot. Blind spots when you're driving. That's a hard thing to teach your kids, isn't it? It is. Because you, you don't know what that is until you've driven. So you're warning your kids, well, listen, there's this blind spot behind you to the right, and in some cars it's bigger, some cars it's smaller, whatever, and you're trying to explain to them, and until they're behind the wheel of the car and they go to make a lane change and they don't do the, the Greg Hubbard, it's in reverse, uh, 
they, they realize, oh, there's an area there where my mirrors can't see. I have to pay attention. When we have a blind spot in our faith, when we have a weak spot in our armor, when we're not fully equipped, we better be on, on the lookout constantly because the attack is coming and we don't know where it's coming from. And when we're not fully equipped, we are a target. When we leave weak spots, the enemy has a target on us. Pride, greed, lust, anxiety, fear, trust issues, unforgiveness, addiction. Leave your weak spot unguarded and the enemy will strike. Don't address your weak spots and the enemy will make you a casualty of this battle. How do we prevent ourselves from becoming a casualty? We put on the full armor of God. You don't need to be a casualty when Jesus has already given us victory. You, you don't have to fail. You don't have to lose because Jesus has already promised us the victory. So Paul reminds us the devil and his schemes are coming against you. If you want to stand, if you want to get through it, if you want to have victory, you must put on all, full, all of the armor of God. Now let's go to verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, some of you read rulers and authorities, and you went to the wrong place mentally. Let me explain this verse to you. All of these rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces, these are, these are rankings of, of demonic forces. Uh, in, in the language here that Paul uses, he's basically saying because there's, there's, there's sergeants and generals and captains, and he's ranking spiritual evil forces against it. His reference to rulers wasn't against physical rulers. His reference to authority wasn't against physical authority. His reference here is very clear. Not only do we have an enemy, Jesus, Paul, they talk about the devil. Some people think the devil's a concept. Nope. Devil's an entity. The devil's a real, real thing. Like, like a fallen angel. He's an angel that fell from heaven. The devil's real. And, and his army's organized. This is what Paul points out. And I don't think the people understood this. I don't think we understand this. I, I don't think we're, we're so physically geared that I think it's very easy for us to kind of overlook this. Paul lays out that not only do we have an enemy, he, he's got like ranks and, and, and legions and specific jobs and descriptions, duties. Like he's got this whole hierarchy of evil help. Now this sounds like something out of a movie, except the Bible makes it abundantly clear. Jesus teaches it. Paul teaches it. It's everywhere. Evil exists. The devil exists. And our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our, our fight is not a physical fight. It's a spiritual fight. And according to verse 12, we got all kinds of enemies. Our fight's not physical. Spiritual. We see examples of this in Scripture. What happens with Adam and Eve? It's a spiritual battle that takes place in the garden. Real Adam, real Eve, created by God, real serpent in the garden said, hey, try this. To drag them, to draw them away from God. There was a spiritual battle with the first humans. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel, for those of you who are like into really weird stuff in scripture, Daniel 10, it's like a party. Uh, an angel tells Daniel of a spiritual battle that was taking place in the heavenly as the angel was coming to deliver to Daniel a message. Uh, book of Job, if you've ever read the book of Job, it starts off in heaven's courtroom with Satan and God discussing the faith of Job. Very real. Jesus even told Peter this, Luke 22. And I think this is powerful. And right from the mouth of Jesus, he says, Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Wow. Now, I know that was a word spoken to Peter. 
But I want you to know today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the enemy desires to sift you like wheat. The, the enemy wants to grind you into a powder. The enemy wants to destroy you and destroy your faith. Every ruler, authority, power of this dark world, spiritual forces, all of them. There's a spiritual battle that is taking place and it's all around us. And there's two choices in this battle. Two parts to it. First, it's a battle of lordship. The spiritual battle that is taking place is a battle of lordship. It's a battle of who will be your master. There's only two choices here. Your master is going to be Jesus or not Jesus. That's it. Now you can fill in the blank under not Jesus with anything you want, but those are the two choices that are presented to us in this spiritual battle. Are we on the Lord's side? Or not. It doesn't matter what not is. We're on God's side or we're not. There is a battle that is taking place for lordship in your life. There are spiritual forces in this world that are all around us that we can't see, but we know in, in Scripture that they are there. And the purpose and the goal of these spiritual forces is to wreck your faith, to pull you away from Jesus. And you have a choice. Will I submit my life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and choose the winning side? Sounds like a no-brainer, folks. Or will I keep playing games and allow the enemy to take these pot shots at me and knock me down and hurt me and continue to try to ruin my faith? You have the choice. You have the option. It's a battle for lordship. Who will be the master of your life? Not only is it a battle for lordship, it's a battle over the mission. It's a battle over the mission. If you belong to Jesus, there is nothing the enemy can do to take your salvation away from you. He can hurt you and tempt you and bug you, but he can't take away your faith. However, and believer, this is where, where I need you to listen in. His number one tactic against a believer can't take their faith, but I can make them ineffective. See, his first goal was to shipwreck your faith. But you've taken steps to avoid that. Your faith is solid. Your salvation is secure in Christ. You can walk away from it, but why would you? That'd be stupid. So the enemy has kind of a plan B. And his plan B is, I will distract you from your mission. Imagine a soldier out on the field, given a task, he's with his platoon, they're heading to checkpoint, alpha, just rolling through the list to get things done, and somewhere around checkpoint echo, <laughs> he just goes off and does his own thing. He's like, hey, look, a squirrel! And he's like, he abandons the troops and everything else. That's ridiculous. That soldier would not be useful to the kingdom, not be useful to his platoon. Christians, the enemy wants to distract you. The enemy wants to get you off on your own thing so you're not thinking about the mission. And I've got to be honest with you. He does a great job at that. He... Our enemy's not weak. Our enemy's not stupid. He's defeated. He's no match for God. He's not God's evil equal. Not at all. But he's not stupid. He's not foolish. And he knows what will pull you away. So there's a battle for lordship in your life, but there's also a battle over the mission. The enemy wants to distract you from your mission as a believer. There are a whole lot of things in this life to distract us from walking and following and carrying out the mission that Jesus has for us, to distract us from what we're supposed to be doing. And this has been going on since the creation of the world. Since Adam and Eve in the garden, the enemy has sought to destroy people's faith and to distract them from the mission of God. 
ask the worship team to, to join me as we wrap it up here. For the next several weeks, we're going to talk about how to prepare for the battle. How to suit up and get ready to stand in the face of the turmoil that is all around us. Used a lot of military, uh, military analogies this morning. I'll end it with one as well. A muster roll is a list of the members of a, a military unit, often includes their rank and the dates they joined or left. Then a roll call is the reading aloud of the names on the muster roll and the responses to determine who is present. Take a roll call to see who's on board, to see who's, who's staying in the fight. You know, the church of Jesus Christ has always had a number of spectators, but God has called us to be soldiers in the fight. Not to spectate, not to sit back and be entertained, not just to worry about our needs, wants, and preferences, but soldiers on the mission of Christ to go and do the work that he has called us to do. God calls us to be soldiers, not spectators. God calls us to stay in the fight. There's another ceremony in the military where they do a final roll call for those who didn't return from battle. I've never been in one of those, but I could only imagine it's incredibly emotional and gut-wrenching. You know, there are many in the Christian faith who don't return from the battle either. There are many who for one reason or another give up. They throw in the towel. They walk away. Word of God talks about the book of life, having your name written in the book. Also talks about having names removed from the book. Again, it's emotional. It's heavy. That final roll call for those fallen soldiers who didn't make it. We can fall into that same trap. We, we can end up on the wrong, on the wrong roll. There's a lot of things that can draw us away from our faith. There's still many today who are walking away from their faith. Where the hardships of the last three, four months have caused some to press into Jesus more than ever. Others have responded differently. And they've walked away from God altogether. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says this as a little reminder to us about our battle, about staying in the fight. It says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. Don't love the values of this world. Don't love the systems of this world. Don't love the pleasures of this world. Don't love the successes of this world. They're powerful. They're attractive. They're intoxicating. Sometimes they're addictive, but they pull us away from Jesus. And the enemy wants to distract you. He wants to pull you away. Forget there's a battle. Forget that there's a battle raging in the heavenlies. Even this morning, the enemy is trying to keep people from making decisions to change their life for Jesus. Right now, right here, in your mind and in, in the spiritual realm, the enemy is fighting against what we're doing. And God and his presence is here, and it's stronger, and we have a choice. A choice of who's going to be Lord and who's going to be Master. God is calling us to himself and for our own safety. He's telling us, put on the armor. Put on the full armor. There is a battle, but we win. Believer, we win. We win in the end. And you know what? We win all the way there when we follow God and we follow his word. Even when the battle is fiercest, even when the battle is raging, when we have Jesus, we never lose. We never lose. We push forward with him. Bow your heads with me this morning, close in a word of prayer. Then I'll have the worship team play this final song for us. 
And if you're here this morning, maybe you heard some things that you've never heard before, and that's okay. I want you to know there's a battle for your soul. And that one wants to destroy you, and the other loved you so much, he came and he laid down his life so that you could have eternal life with him. Choose life. Choose Jesus. Let him be the Lord of your life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, male, female, black or white, rich or poor, none of that matters. It doesn't matter what your parents believe. It doesn't matter what your parents believed. This is just between you and God. How is your love relationship with Jesus? How is your walk with him? Submit your life to the God who loves you. And believer, buckle up. Prepare for the battle that we face each and every day so that we can have the victory that God wants us to have, so that we can be more than conquerors through him who strengthened us. Stand together with me. Bow your heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, God, that you have given us victory. And en route to that ultimate victory, Lord, you've laid out the path for us. You've shown us the way to go and how to prepare and how to be ready and how to suit up so that in this life we don't have to be overcome. In this world, we don't have to be overwhelmed. God, that we don't have to let the attacks of fear and stress and anxiety take hold in our life. Lord, we don't have to allow the distractions of lust and pride and greed and success to get us off track. Lord, you told us to put on the full armor, to suit up, to be ready, to stand, to stand firm in the face of the battle. Lord, I pray this morning for believers who are ready to stand. Lord, so that when the role is taken, they can say, I'm here, I am present, I am in the fight. God, that we stand for you. We do not back down. Father, help us to put on this full armor that we'll be talking about. Help us to give you every part of our life. No weak spots, no blind spots, no targets for the enemy. God, we give you every part. Be glorified in your church. Be glorified in our lives. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please put your mask back on as we close with a song. stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop. You never stop working.
Jesus, we thank you for who you are and for what you've done. But Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we as your saints would put on that full armor, God, and we would go in victory and in strength for you are God alone and you are good. We love you, Jesus. And everybody said amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for coming and joining us today. We're going to start dismissing in the back, back couple rows, and just kind of space yourself out. Remember, 